Yeah. Or if you're on the main floor, the purple chairs. Good for you. <laughs> and those who are watching online, he died for you as well. But why did he have to die? Where did this whole thing start? Well, this whole thing is a trial. God is the righteous judge. But let's break it down a minute and let's talk this thing through. Because if there is a trial, then there is a prosecution and there is a defense. And there is something in the atmosphere because we're in a very judgmental moment in time where people are quick to judge others without knowing the whole story. We judge people based on things like where they come from and what their educational background is or what they look like or what, or what, or what we think we know from people we've heard. And maybe the information you got is not correct because the person who's bringing it doesn't like the person they're talking about. Be careful who you receive information from and make sure you understand the motive when you get it. I'm preaching already. This whole earth is a trial. There is a world that is more real than the world we are currently occupying. The Bible says that we believe that the things that were seen and that are seen were created from that which is unseen, that God spoke and out of nothing came something. There is a spiritual world more real than the physical world. You can't see it, but there are angels and demons, principalities in high places warring even now. There were whispers about it in the book of Daniel that when he fasted and prayed, it wasn't that God didn't hear him, but there was a principality over the, over the region Region, stopping the answer of his prayer from getting to him, which means right above your head could be the answer to your prayer, but there might be a principality trying to keep you from getting it. So don't get upset at God. Get more passionate in your prayer. Get more passionate in your position, and maybe God will send help in heavenly places to bring to you what you've been praying for. I need somebody to stir up their gift tonight. My grandmother said you should expect miracles around Easter. She's in heaven now. She's a part of the great cloud of witnesses. But I still believe that Jesus can do miracles this week. Does anybody else believe that he can do it? Satan doesn't like you. In fact, he hates you. Jesus makes it clear that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Revelations 12 and 10 says this, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Somebody needs to get excited that trouble won't last always and that that devil that's been messing with you has a time limit on the attack on your life and he is being cast down. This is the worst week for Satan because he is constantly reminded of how little power he actually has because he thought he had the power on Friday and woke up on Sunday with nothing because Jesus took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And I need somebody to get a little excited in here because the cross was not the end. Five second praise break. <laughs> Satan wants to put humanity on trial. The book of Job, which is the earliest book in scripture. It is not the first book chronologically. Genesis is the first book we read, but the first book written is Job. And in it, it gives you an insight into spiritual things and how spiritual things work. And the reason why that's important is because for the purposes of this message, I need you to understand why the devil keeps messing with you. Help me, Holy Ghost. You're on trial. The enemy wants to keep accusing you, bringing up evidence of the things you and I have done wrong. 
when I give you the title of this message, and I'm going to preach short so we can get home. But the title of the message is, I Rest My Case. I wish I, I, wish I was in a, I, I just wish I could act up, but I'm going to say it again just for me, for all the times that the enemy has tried to shut my mouth tried to minimize my praise, tried to tell me I wasn't worthy, that I didn't have value, that I didn't deserve what God wanted to give me, that I was unqualified, that I didn't have what it took. I am so grateful that Jesus declared, I rest my. Somebody give Jesus a praise if you believe it. Satan wants to silence your mouth. Every time you lift your hands and start singing off key, it makes him so mad. <laughs> Gets on his nerves. And it's not your talent that he's angered by. It's your heart and the fact that God receives your worship, just, it just tears him apart. And if you notice in the book of Job, chapter 1, starting at the sixth verse, it says these words, it gives you an intimate look into deep spiritual truths, how heaven operates and how the earth needs to shift. Now there was a day, this is Job chapter one, verse six, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. What happened in this exchange is that humanity was put on trial. God had an angelic census and all the angels showed up and the Bible says Satan showed up too. He didn't break into heaven because you can't sneak into heaven. I'm getting ready to help you to understand who Satan is and also who he's not. Because they got a whole horror movie genre to make Satan bigger than what he actually is. We make Satan to be this big malevolent being who can be anywhere at any time and possess anyone at any moment. And we even got some people with some bad theology that say, be careful who you pray for because that spirit could jump on you. <laughs> Where'd you read that? I haven't seen that in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Let me help you to understand something about the devil. The Bible says the sons of God showed up and Satan came too. Number one, there's a distinction between the two. But then the Bible says the Lord spoke to Satan and said, where'd you come from? And the Bible says Satan answered. Let me help you to understand something about authority, about power. He had to answer because he was under authority. When I'm in my house, I may answer if I want to, but I don't have to, because it's my house. But if you're in my house, and I want to know what you're here for, and you a visitor or a stranger, you better answer. I'm trying to help you. Satan has to answer to God. Oh, y'all missed that. Satan is not just some awesome, super scary thing that just, he can do whatever he wants. He is on assignment, particularly in the life of a believer, and he cannot do anything in your life unless God allows it or ordains it. And if God allows it or ordains it, it is to bring about glory out of the situation. I'm trying to help somebody today. The enemy cannot just show up in your life if you have 
confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord. The blood has covered you. The Holy Spirit has been given to you as a deposit until the day of redemption. So yes, the enemy can oppress, but he cannot possess because he didn't pay for my soul. So he cannot occupy my soul. I need somebody to get... Tell somebody we're on trial. God said, hey man, you consider my servant Job, and he's faithful. That's my guy. <laughs> Satan was like, yeah, but his love is conditional. Why is the enemy messing with Job? Why does Satan hate us so much? Because God chose us over him. For those who don't know, Satan, according to scripture, was Lucifer, an anointed cherub who covers. He had instruments inside his body. He didn't need a band or singers. He was the band and the singers. He was the percussion, the rhythm, the drums, the bass, the piano, the keys, and he was the alto, soprano, tenor, and bass. He had it all. And he was so good at what he did and so beautiful when he did it that when he rebelled, a third of heaven's angels chose his gift over God's presence. That's why churches struggle today because we get enamored with people's gifts. But gifts don't mature, character does. I'd rather have a submitted worship leader with mediocre talent that is full with the, filled with the Holy Ghost than a talented person with a great voice and no lifestyle. Ain't nobody gonna clap on that. It's all right, you know why? Because even in the church, we've gotten caught up in talent. But talent can't destroy no yoke. Talent can't make a demon leave your life. Talent doesn't make cancer shrivel up and die. You better have some anointing. You better have some power. And you better have a relationship with the living Jesus. Is there anybody that knows Jesus Christ makes all the difference? I understand that we all come from different places, different backgrounds. We come from different denominations. And I honor the fact that we all come from different places. And even here in America, we have a geo-religious construct. Because if you go to California, they worship Jesus differently. In the deep south, they worship Jesus differently. The black Pentecostal church is going to be a four-hour service, so pack a lunch. Lakewood's going to be 89 minutes, unless I'm preaching. And then it's going to be 98 minutes. Pray for me. But but what's interesting to me is how the enemy has utilized our differences to keep us apart. Same Jesus, but we look at each other side eye. Mm -mm. I don't know what language that is. Apparently, they call that tongues. That's a little weird. It's not really my bag of tricks. Somebody over here, oh, well, they don't speak in tongues. That means they don't have no Holy Ghost, so I certainly don't want to fool with them. Well, I'm apostolic. Well, I'm Methodist. Well, I'm Baptist. Well, I'm primitive Baptist. Well, I'm AME. Well, I'm non-denominational, which is a denomination, by the way. <laughs> All of these separations, organized brokenness, keeping us apart, and we took the bait. We've been on trial since the beginning of time, ever since God opened his mouth and said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Satan has been trying to prove to God that he made a mistake in choosing you over him. Which is why, Anzio, he keeps referring, he's being referred to in Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. And he doesn't just accuse Dr. Paul occasionally. The Bible says he accuses day and night. He is obsessed. He is absolutely consumed with trying to 
undermine and delegitimize your worship. He wants you to shut your mouth. He wants to prove to God that God was foolish and unwise in allowing you to get his position. Ooh, help me somebody. See, because here's the thing. Satan's entire case, because he's been building a case. How many people know? Satan, you know he, he's, he's the accuser of the brother. And every time you do something wrong, oh, got him again. I got him. Just, you were in traffic, said the wrong thing. Oh, got him. <laughs> Flipping through the channels. You were going to TBN, but you ended up on the wrong channel and saw some things, but you didn't delete it fast enough. You just stayed there for a minute. Then you heard somebody, uh-oh, keep, keep going to the Jesus ship. Yes, yes. Mm, hallelujah. Oh. <laughs> He's looking for every imperfection. He's looking for any single thing that can cause God to disqualify you. Why? Because Satan had a position and he was so caught up in his position and he wants his position back. And of all the people that God chose to replace he, uh, Satan, he chose me and you. A being with, with thousands of vocal cords and instruments and we only got two vocal cords. Ooh, I'm getting ready to go somewhere. See, because Satan's still caught up in the talent thing. They can't even do what I do. God says, I don't need them to do what you do. I just need them to do what they're supposed to do. So, here's what the enemy is after. He's after your status as a son. Because we are now sons of God. You do know that. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You don't realize that position. How many parents do we have in here? How many people in here? How many men have a, a child named after them? How many, where am I, where am I? Stand up, sir, stand up. If you have a, a son named after you, stand up. Let me ask you something. When you have a son named after you, is there anything that you wouldn't do to protect that boy? Talk to me, fellas. If somebody was messing with your son, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is Texas. So, so you already know it's Second Amendment all day long. Come for me and mine, and either I'm going to pray for you or I'm going to help you go see Jesus. It's one of the two. I might not even pray for you. <laughs> you have a son that has your name, which means they carry not only your DNA, but they carry your legacy. They can perpetuate your gifts, your calling. What you speak into them, they can take to the next generation. Now, watch this. How many gentlemen in here have a son? It may not be named after you, but it's still your son. Where yet? You at? Where are all the fellas at? Stand up, fellas. I'm getting ready to show you something about, about how God looks at sonship. Jesus in Matthew, when he got baptized, God said this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What had Jesus done up to that point? Nothing. He hadn't healed one person. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. No withered hands stretched out, no blind eyes open, no deaf ears open, but because he was a son, he had immediate status. I need you to know that no matter what you do, your status does not change with God. I'm trying to help not just the fellas, because ladies, you are also children of God, and for the purposes of this, sonship is a spiritual declaration, which means you can be female and still operate as a son, which means you have an inheritance with God, which means if anybody messes with you, they got to an answer to your father. Now watch this, before you sit down, I'm getting ready to help you with something. Your status is a son. You have a son, so he also has status. Anybody mess with my son, they're not just messing with John, they're messing with John Gray, the fourth. They're not just messing with Paul, 
Jr. Is it Paul Jr.? Okay, okay. So, what's your son's name? Carmelo. All right. So, Brandon, Brandon, Andrew, Montgomery, Bam. Your son is Carmelo, Andrew, Montgomery. So, Bam and Cam. So, if they don't, if they mess with Cam, they gonna get the Bam. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Because it's something that wakes up in us when somebody's messing with our son. Because sons carry seed, and seed carries legacy, and legacy carries purpose, and purpose carries status, and status carries authority. And my status is a son, but my seat is my authority.